I only found out earlier this morning that I was going to be filmed, so I promise there'll be nothing controversial. Or nothing <laughs> um, it's going to be a, a sort of a 30 or so minute romp through um, why, I was in, why I became involved with the project, um, how I set about the research and drawing together the work of lots of other people who put a huge amount of time into the, the history of the town and also the current exchange. Um, talk to you a little bit about significance uh, in conservation terms. It's, it's a, an interpretation and a meaning which is it's very different to normal sort of uh, everyday English. Um, and then throw some ideas out there for the future, I think, is really where I go with this. Um, <coughs> before I, I get on to any of that, I, I just, I don't really expect anybody to shout out or, or give me answers, but just to ponder for a minute on why we have a an interest and a, a love of old buildings. Uh, for me personally, it started when I was this big. I grew up in the rural Lincolnshire Fens and had hundreds of acres to play and explore in. And uh, spent many, many happy hours with a couple of pals rooting around in old farmhouses, barns, windmills, railway buildings, you name it. And the fascination has stayed with me ever since. So, me personally, I've made a career in, in buildings, architecture and planning. And I'm very lucky for that and very grateful. Um, one of the things I love is, is the beauty of the buildings. They're, they're often very cleverly designed, beautifully made and crafted. Um, but what I think is important, and I, I've gauged this from sort of spending a bit more time in Muslich again recently, is that they, they tell our story. They tell the story of the town, the community, the people within it. And we all, we all have individual memories or, or reasons for having a, a certain interest or a, a softness or a fondness for places. And I think it's something which was open, had opened the doors and had so many different events, uh, such as the, uh, the Corn Exchange, means that there are, even still, lots and lots of people who have great memories or stories to tell about the place. And uh, I, mean, I think the exhibition that Norman and the team have put together has done a marvellous job in sort of teasing out those stories and, and helping us to bring them together and show why we think this building is so important. Okay. My background, as I say, was in building and architects. I worked for architects uh, as a draftsman, a technician, and assistant. Um, I then became a project officer and, and worked for several years as a conservation officer, mainly in Lincolnshire and in Peterborough. Um, and with listed buildings, which obviously ours is a grade two in the Corn Exchange. This gives it a degree of legal protection. It means that things that you could ordinarily do to say to a modern house, you need consent from the local council. And this becomes very difficult, uh, or it can become very difficult. There's a huge raft of guidance which is available to tell people how to do it. Um, a lot of agents and uh, people who draw plans or put applications together aren't aware of this, but the approach that the Trust has taken by getting people involved at a very early stage with this sort of knowledge and experience, and I don't just mean myself, I mean engineers and architects who are very well versed in, in these sort of processes, means that this is being approached in a very thorough and proper and comprehensive way. So the statement of significance, which I've spent the last few months putting together, um, is really an investigation of the building, and it's presenting a case to say what it is, what history is, why bits of it are important, why other bits are perhaps not important, because all buildings change and evolve through time. And to commit that to paper, so that it's written in a way that anybody and everybody can understand it, uh, including your average planning officer, which uh, is perhaps the crux of the matter in, in a year or so of time. Um, but also in this case, because we need to be making applications to the, um, correct me if I'm wrong, it will be the Heritage Lottery from the next time, will it, I suspect, to get the, uh, I suspect, rather large amount of money we need to, to bring this back into uh, uh, a good and fit condition and suitable for community uses. Um, so where do you begin? Well, with my archaeology hat on, you go to the building and you have a look round, and that's generally my favourite bit of <coughs> the process. Um, you look at the fabric, you look at the condition, you try and work out the, the age and date of things and uh, condition is obviously very important but it allows me to or any other conservation professional to have an input into the architect's brief which, you know, which sets out what they're going to try and achieve with the building and how they might adapt or alter it 
but also the client's expectations of the building. And when I say clients, I don't just mean Norman and trust on the end of the which I think is, is a key part of this project. So it helps us to identify what's valuable in architectural terms. And when we uh, hinted at significance earlier, significance when in the heritage you're thinking about it is um, the architectural or the aesthetic interest. It's also the evidential or archaeological interest. It tells you how things were done, the way that society worked, whether the businesses or industries work, and how those were involved in that. Uh, we also have um, communal value, and now that's an interesting one because um, different buildings mean different things to different people. Somebody who's religious obviously cares much more about a church than the average atheist, for, for example, but that's the sort of uh, rationale behind it. Um, the other, the other area really is the historical associations, and that can be the history of the building itself, why it was built, the sort of things that went on there. Um, it can also be uh, the, uh, the architects or the designers, if they were particularly famous, or it was a, a, a groundbreaking way of doing things, that makes it important, and that's an historical association which has value to it. Um, and also, if there's a, an association with historic events or interesting events, and uh, I think if you've had a chance to have a look at this wonderful exhibition, you can see there's been such a variety of things that have gone on that the, uh, I keep going to call it the Cornwall, that's King's Lynn, and I realise that's not a good idea to mention King's Lynn, I think it's finished, uh, the Corn Exchange. Um, again, a history of entertainment and activities which spans well over 100 years, and uh, you know, international superstars have been here, which is, is a wonderful thing. So, as I say, first, first stages was to get into the building, crawl around, look in all the nooks and crannies, and then sort of make an assessment of it. The good news is it's in pretty good condition for the most part. Um, so, we haven't got huge structural issues to, to contend with at this stage, which I think is, is quite a welcome relief. There, there are bits and pieces to do, but uh, generally speaking, it's, it's worth the effort to bring it back into use, which is, is an excellent starting point. Then, you head to the local studies centre, and Wiz Beach is blessed with a rather good library by general standards, I would say. So, big thumbs up to Wiz Beach and that. And also, you've got the wonderful uh, Wiz Beach Museum, which has got a huge range of stuff. And I know that Norman has spent quite a lot of time over there, and the staff have been very, well, the volunteers have been very kind in allowing him to see and copy various plans and drawings, some of which, are, the photographs of which, will be put into the statement with the, the blessing of the, uh, the museum. Wiz Beach, because and I say this as a Spalding boy, although I do have an affinity for this speech. My, my granddad played football here for this speech town in the late 40s when they used to win a lot of things. And uh, my granddad's cousin had a, a gun shop in the old market many, many years ago. So I, I was a regular visitor, and I've always thought it was a, a rather beautiful place. I still most people who ever come here and write about it. Um, so, one of the things that Wiz Beach is blessed with is a fantastic photographic record. You've got the Lillian Ring collection, which I'm sure many of you have seen. You've got the Samuel Smith photographs, which are very early and, and amazing, I think, as well. But then there's individual families here <coughs> photographs and things that they've brought as well, and some of them have been used here, I think. Um, lots and lots has been written about Wiz Beach by some of the most famous architectural historians. Pevsner, Nicholas, Sir Nicholas Pevsner, to give him his full title, who uh, <coughs> did the England series, which covers every county in England. Um, it, it's slightly ironic to me that a German wrote the best books about um, how important and beautiful our architecture was, but good luck to him anyway. Um, he said that uh, the North Brink was perhaps the finest Jordan Street in England, and other writers have said similar things over the last few hundred years. So we know that this speech is special and there's been a huge amount written about it, which has been very helpful to me. And I mean, even since I started on this project, another couple of books have been written which have been really helpful. Uh, can I give those a quick mention, Norman? Um, I've made a note of them just in case. I'm a bit rusty. I've been locked away in archives for years, so it's, uh, it's quite nice to get out and speak to people. If I can find my glasses. Um, there's the Inns and Taverns book. Um, which is quite interesting, and that, that's a really good start to the story, in actual fact. That was Andrew Ketley, I just not by any chance, is he? Very <coughs> interesting, it was one that was flagged up to me by Norman, and 
really, I'll just give you a quick timeline now. I mean, some of you may know this better than I do, but uh, prior to the, uh, the Common Exchange being built there, there was a pub called the Nags Head, which by all accounts seems to have been a Tudor building. And that was bought by a doctor and then sold on to the town corporation. And uh, the first Corn Exchange was built in 1811. Neoclassical building, a little bit ahead of the curve, nationally speaking. Um, we'd obviously started the Industrial Revolution. There was a huge shift of population to um, towns and cities. And so the agricultural centres, with speech being a major one, realised that uh, they needed to organise the sale of grain more efficiently and effectively to get top dollar. So they, the corporations had more money and they built these wonderful buildings to, uh, to trade from. The irony is, is that it was, I think it was only, what was it, 1831, the arcades which were open on the ground floor where people traded and had their stores. And um, it seems that, uh, <coughs> People prefer to do their business elsewhere, and I can't confirm this, but based on research I've done in other towns, they, they went to the nearest pool because it was more convenient <laughs> and uh, not open to the elements. So the, um, the original design, and there's a lovely quote here, uh, they wanted to have genteel entertainments and uh, uh, lectures and things to improve um, and instruct the citizens, I think it was called. Uh, there's the Walker and Craddock book from the mid 19th century, which I'm sure several of you have seen. There's a copy in the library, which is well worth a look. And it says, The purpose of public and other meetings, assemblies, the performance of concerts, delivery of lectures, public exhibitions, respectable auctions. I'm not sure what the, uh, <laughs> the other side of that would be. Uh, perhaps they could foresee car boots. Uh, public library or bazaar to the satisfaction of capital burgesses. So they must have been the big bricks at the time, I guess. Um, but uh, a very important building, obviously, and they're quite often built near marketplaces and, and near granaries and transport, which obviously would have been the river in those days. By 19, oh, sorry, 1836, it had become the town hall because the, the role and responsibilities of the corporation were getting bigger and better. And there were, there were lots of improvements there. The bit that I was first commissioned to look at is obviously the, the huge second phase at the back, which um, was a guy called uh, Pearson Bellamy, who's a very underrated architect, it's not just me who says that. Um, he uh, was in practice in Lincoln, and uh, so there's a good connection there for me. Um, he was in partnership with a guy called Hardy, who was a surveyor. And their stock in trade, they, they, they're really quite remarkable. They won national competitions against some of the well-known greats. Um, but they seem to have a specialisation in corn exchanges, town halls, uh, and bizarrely cemeteries. They, they were at the forefront of cemetery design for, for some reason. They designed the um, gatehouses and cemetery at Loughborough, which I've actually surveyed about 25 years ago, and it's, it's quite special. Um, so it was ahead of the curve, it was in really good nick. The, essentially, what they were after was a huge space where people could come with small stands, bring their grain, whatever else, and everybody would come in, <coughs> do business, and everybody would go away. But from the outset, it was always intended as a multiple use space. It was a, as, as any of you have been in there, it's a good size space. You could play five or five football in there if you really wanted to. So it was, it was flexible, it was very adaptable. And there were <coughs> entertainments there. There was concerts and Shakespeare recitals, flower shows, poultry shows, which was a bit of a surprise to me, um, given the potential for mess and noise. Um, in the 1880s, it then became uh, the volunteer drill hall. A lot of towns, I mean, there's quite a very distinct building type around the UK for drill halls. I think. The powers that being realised that our, our standing army was a little bit on the uh, slender side and not on the resource. So they obviously encouraged the creation of drill halls and local regiments and local volunteers. And it was, I think in the, the initial stages it was intended to be quite a social thing, but it was also somebody was late. Um, it was intended to uh, to be there just in case. And nearly 30 odd years later, then we had the advent of the First World War. So it became the uh, uh, drill hall used by the Cambridgeshire Battalion, the Rifles Battalion, and they changed their name to the E Company, 
and it was used as a centre of recruitment, training, uh, and I think there's some wonderful photographs of people. Uh, I'd be interested to know if anybody's ever managed to sort of trace all the, uh, the soldiers and whether they actually made it back or not. I think that's been done in other towns <coughs> involved with huge amounts of work. After the war, during the 30s, obviously light jazz and other concerts and things sort of carried on there and uh, was well used by the community. Um, then, as everybody knows, we had the Second World War come upon us and it became the HQ for one of the Cambridgeshire regiments. Also the HQ for the Home Guard, who, uh, having spoken to lots of gentlemen in my early career who were in the Home Guard, it wasn't all Dad's army, it was quite serious at times. Um, and I, I mentioned to Norman, it's uh, creeping around in the basement and amongst all the cobwebs and the bits and pieces of bingo paraphernalia and all the rest of it. There looks to be what I think is a ramshackle bomb shelter in the basement. Um, my first thoughts were that it wasn't very big, and my second thought was, would it actually be very good if something sort of landed directly on top of you? And I suspect the answer would be no, but at least they did try. Um, another use was obviously as the British restaurant. Um, I think these were dotted about the country, and uh, I think one of the ladies who's been to the exhibition said that uh, you could get a good dinner for a shilling, which I thought was rather good. Um, so, by the end of the war, oh, during the war, still some fantastic concerts. Um, I don't know if anybody has ever come across this. I, I was tickled by the name Harry Parry and his radio sextet. I thought it was a fabulous name. You're not going to forget that in a hurry. Um, but some really big stars uh, came here to perform, even in the earlier days. Uh, Ronnie Scott, Joe Ross, the John Barry Seven. I mean, all big names, um, if, if you're into your history and music, as I know Norman is, obviously. Um, your father took over and took a lease on in 1948 for the grand sum of £1,000, I think, mm -hmm. which uh, I'm guessing was quite a huge sum of money in those days, but uh, obviously paid dividends. Um, so roller skated, sorry, I've written the dates down because I, I wouldn't remember these, I think you've had to correct me once before. Roller skating, which any, any ex roller skaters here? Probably not ex roller skaters. <laughs> <laughs> We, we used to have it in an old uh, portal frame building on Spalding Market, and it was a concrete floor, and some of the bigger lads used to give you a shove, and I've still got sort of scars <laughs> where I went down my elbows. And I was skate I was a reasonable skater. I remember skating around and showing off to a pretty young girl who I got my eye on, and a big lad came up behind me and pushed me. And I, I, I literally <coughs> slid in on the concrete floor from here to the doors. And when I got up, everybody was laughing, but they were laughing more than I thought they should have been. The reason was it so I went home bare cheek. I'm hoping the it was a little bit safer there. It would have been wooden, so hopefully not yeah. quite so bad. Um, I'm just looking for the dates for the roller skating because I know that I got it wrong before. Do forgive me. It was actually 75 years ago last month. Goodness me. I've got 48 to 65. Okay, and is that about right? Yeah. When I used to go and, yeah. and uh, anyway, so there's I've mentioned in, in the um, the back of the report um, is a, is a very comprehensive bibliography of all the, the sort of books that many of you already know, and some of the more recent ones. Um, one of the advantages of the last fifteen years or so is that there's lots of stuff available online. Um, you can sort of disappear for days on end if you're into it as much as I am. But um, there's a the Cambridgeshire community. Archives Network. Archives Network, thank you, you saved me there. Um, they did an exhibition which is in the library, it's only a small sort of poster size thing, but um, they were talking about uh, music in Cambridgeshire in the district, and their conclusion was that the years 62 to 64 were perhaps the, uh, the most um, fantastic, I suppose, for want of a better word, because of the nature of the people who were coming along, and again, there'd been a little bit of confusion with some of the, uh, the reference material about who'd actually been there, but I mean, I'm, I'm always going to defer to Norman on that one because he's got the scrapbooks and knows. But um, Manfred Mann, The Rolling Stones, Tom Jones, Lulu, no, the gentleman here shaking his head. No. <laughs> Am I wrong or do you not like any of those? Yeah, all on, but not, not Tom Jones. Not Tom Jones. No. Yeah. He, he went to Peter by a call at Shage. Um, Adam Faith. Adam Faith, that was the one I like. Oh, they played on the radio the other day. What now? Which I love. That was played to me as a kid and I still remember it. Um, 
Without wanting to call co controversy, I, I, I understand that uh, from some of my internet uh, research that uh, Keith um, Richards in his autobiography, which is about yay thick, uh, fondly or remembers very clearly playing in his speech and that he wasn't very well received by the locals because of the way he dressed. Um, my own conclusion, without wanting to wade in too deeply, is that I'm surprised Keith remembers much about the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> um, there you go. Not everybody remembers it fondly. Um, again, another book plug. Um, Dancing in the Dark um, by Kevin Rogers, which I think... Is that the chap there? Can I ask how many hundreds of hours of work did that take? I know I recognised your face. I've got to say that. It took me months. I can believe it, but all thank the, you. All the information came from local newspapers. So I looked at every newspaper and took every other. Uh, is that on the, um, the British newspaper archive online? Because that's... Uh, no, I, I did it either in Wisbech or Cambridge. Oh, goodness me. Well, I, I take my hat off to you, sir, and uh, I think it may be advisable when we, we do put publications in for the grant that we put a copy of your book in with it, because I think it's so useful, so thank you. Um, right, I digress, I do apologise. Um, This comes back to where I think the future lies for this building, and it's the variety of other uses that were there. I mean, I think if you've had a chance to have a look at the exhibition, you can see everything from pageants to concerts to recitals. I mean, it's, it's just endless, the possibilities with this space like that. And I think the vision of the trust, essentially, is to bring it back into a community use with, with mixed uses, um, you know, adaptable and functional and accessible. Uh, and catering for things that perhaps uh, are more important these days post-COVID, bringing people together and learning things. And, um, but uh, I think we need to gauge you and other people. Well, this has been the whole purpose of the exhibition for the last three months. But uh, um, I'm nearly at the end. I think I hope I've not gone too far. Though. No, not yet. Um, in terms of significance which is where we, we need to sell it to the, uh, the grant givers. It's, uh, in itself, it's a, I, I personally think the frontage is a beautiful piece of architecture. It's classical, it complements the street. The street, it's not just me that says it, it's Pevsner, it's Arthur and me, it's one of the finest in the country. And uh, West Beach is a, is a town above most I can think of in many, many ways. Um, there's the the community interest in it, all the stories that people have gotten brought forward, and there's a, I mean, I honestly can't think of a site or a building that I've worked on where there's such a wealth of information out there that tells such a story. Um, so there's, there's that side of it. Um, it's also a decent building with what we'd call a huge amount of embodied energy. It took a lot of energy, materials, and resources to build that building, and it still stands up, and it's still usable. So it makes perfect sense in the 21st century to reuse it for something that's going to benefit the town and the wider district. Um, and uh, I think on that note, I'm going to stop talking before I start to ramble. There are a couple of things I just wanted to chuck in there that tickled me. Um, there's a lovely photograph from the Lillian, uh, Lillian Ring collection which shows firemen in the old regalia and a ladder. And uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's fairly obvious that they would be going up and down ladders and carrying people out to show that they could do it in, their, in an emergency. I think I also read, and I, you'll have to forgive me because I can't remember the reference, but they said that they encouraged their colleagues to jump out of the windows and then catch them at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> that tickled me and made me laugh out loud when I came across that. And the other one, which I, I think is, is a nice touch, really, when, when your dad and your uncle were organising all the big events, on some of the posters, they were they were laying on buses to all the outlying towns and villages, and you just think, oh, I mean, I know it got the punters in and it got them home, but what a forward way of thinking all those years ago. And uh, that's perhaps another thing that we can build into it. Anyway, thank you for your time. If you've got anything interesting or uh, <coughs> useful, please don't hesitate to tell myself, Norman, or any of the team. And uh, hopefully in the next few days we'll get the, the first draft of this, the um, statement of significance out there for you. And uh, as always, I, I always say this to all my clients, I'm never precious about these things. I don't know everything, I don't pretend to. It's only when people mock in and 
contribute, we, we can get it better, or get it right, and hopefully uh, attract some big money from down south. So, uh, thank you.